Hey, everybody, Pro Bowl vote is here. An awesome Pro Bowl starts with awesome players, and your vote helps decide who gets a spot on the AFC and the NFC roster. Show your love, cast your vote, and make sure your favorite players make it to the 2020 Pro Bowl. Vote today and be entered to win exclusive prizes at NFL.com slash Pro Bowl vote. And speaking of football, let's start the show. The Dave Damashek Football Program, available on Apple Podcasts and at NFL.com slash DDFP. Now here's your host, Dave Damashek. Oh yes, hi and hello football fans. Welcome to the Dave Damashek Football Program, presented as always by our pals over at Zaxby's, home of the famous chicken fingers, wings, and salads. Go get you some, can't wait. Miami, Florida is closer than you think it is. Perhaps Eddie Spaghetti, we can pay a visit there when uh, when we pay a visit to the Sunshine State. There's Eddie Spaghetti over there, and look who's seated to my immediate right. What a pleasure. I barely recognize him. It's been so long. It's, it's our crazy. old pal. You listen to him if you're lucky enough to do so. When the Los Angeles Rams are playing, he sits alongside J.B. Long. You watch him on NFL Network all over the place. It's Maurice Jones-Drew. What's happening, fella? I'm doing wonderful, Shaq. Are you? I, I mean, not really. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm all in. I, I'm, I feel like all my – well, I can't say all my teams because the Raiders are actually playing really well right now. They have mm-hmm. a chance to, to win the West. I don't know. I, th- I don't even know that you can still claim them as your Raiders. Uh yeah, I mean I grew up a Raiders fan. I played I for them for one year. I know, but if like, you had to rank them, they, they would they're, now they're, be a distant third. They're definitely third, right? I mean they didn't pay as much as the Jags, and then they don't currently pay me. So so you're back from a uh, a trip to the banks of the Three Rivers. One, I'm envious, and two, a- I say that we can listen to you alongside JB Long. But based on a preseason bet that you and me made, which was if the Steelers miss the playoffs and the Rams make it, the Dave Damashek football program in the 2020 offseason becomes the Maurice Jones-Drew football program. Right. That's looking like that's not going to happen. It's very slim. It's now, very slim probability. If it is the Steelers in the postseason and no Rams, then for one game, Dave Damashek gets to sit in the booth with J.B. Long, and I think we are tracking in that direction, Maurice. I, 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 well, you know, it's funny you say that because in the booth next to me mm. in uh, Heinz Field, which was which was awesome, by the way, uh, Jack Del Rio was there, my old football coach, and he calls the games for uh, ESPN Radio, and we got a chance to talk. He does their national broadcast, and he said he said this game here is a playoff game. Mm-hmm. And I mean, he used to tell us that too. Like, in, there's certain times of the season, depending on the team's records and the schedule going forward, like you may play a playoff game in the regular season. He was like, this is what this is because. Whoever loses this one, you pretty much you're 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 on a real uphill. You remember football mountain? That's what you're on. You're you're climbing for real now. Mount Lombardi, situation. you and yeah. me, Maurice, climbing up the side of yeah. it come January. Maybe we'll get back to that in a couple of yeah, months. But yeah, listen, know. Del Rio. As uh, as an aside, he paid us a visit in Studio 66 over the summertime, and he had uh, he regaled us with some stories about Maurice Jones' trip. <laughs> yeah, no, they're probably, he loved you. Well, that's my guy, man. Uh, we had a great conversation, um, but. He was just talking about it, and so I, I, I firmly believe the same thing because, you know, I think if Pittsburgh were lost, you guys would have been, what, four and five? Four and five. I did think, though, that the head-to-head, and I continue to stand by this, but now they're they're ahead of schedule as far as I'm concerned. Where Pittsburgh is, they needed they, – they have the head-to-head against the Chargers, right. and that still matters. The Chargers are not completely out of it. Um, one and two. Now, more significantly, they have the head-to-head against the Colts. Then the Colts lose on Sunday. Right. Then, as I forecasted, they would the uh, the Browns vanquish the Bills. So now the head-to-heads for Pittsburgh are kind of coming together, and they have two now coming up with Cleveland. If they can take one of those two, I think they're really oh. in in good shape for getting to January. Yeah, it, it's gonna be it's gonna be an interesting. The AFC as a whole is very interesting, and then. You know, in that situation, because there's so many teams right there in the mix. Like, mm-hmm. you still have the Jags that have an opportunity. Uh, obviously, the Colts have fallen back now. Huge he, win for the Titans. Yeah, huge win for the you Titans. You know who called that one, Maurice? Did you Dave call Damashek it? Dave called that call? one, too. I, I, didn't I, Eddie Spaghetti? Did. I didn't believe that. I, I, I didn't, but, I mean, I don't know how somehow somewhere they found a way. I mean, Derrick Henry was just running rampant. M- Maurice, but that's – I mean that's the trend. If you're let's let, let's bounce around. Let's do a good week ten review. I like to hear. We haven't seen you in so long. Yeah, I'd like not? to catch up with the man, Maurice Jones Drew. But let's jump in on hot football action and uh, and start there. This is what I said exactly one month ago 
to to today. I announced, I'm sorry, the Chiefs are exciting. I'd like to see them go far. The Patrick Mahomes storyline is great. But this is shaping up to be Dan Marino in the mid-'80s. This is a flawed team. Patrick Mahomes can't cover up everything. And just like I said before the Titans game, they are going to get trucked by Derrick Henry. They are not built to st- – there's just no way that they're going to be able to stand up to that in at minimum – two playoff games in the AFC, and probably the way it's shaping up, it's going to be three games that they're going to have to be able to stop a playoff caliber run offense. That, that's just not going to work out for them. Yeah, yeah. well, the thing is, like, this is when Derrick Henry starts to run. Mm-hmm. And yep. I want to say last year he had like 1,000 yards in four games or something like that. You're going to see that now. They're, they're literally going to lean on him as the weather is turning. And so um, I, I think the Titans are going to be very scary. Now, they, they, they have some injuries, and you're starting to see the injury bug kind of pick, in, pick up, but – I think Derrick Henry and the Titans are a team that's very sneaky. Now, you want to talk about a team that's scary is the Houston Texans. And I know they had a bye week this week, but I got a chance to watch them in London play the Jags. And Deshaun Watson is definitely up there for the MVP. Now, he's battling some Mm -hmm. other guys, but he he was out there with no one to block for. Maurice, you know what? I'm going to say something to you that uh, that might – feel like I don't know what it sounds like but but you and I uh you know no jive the no jive policy right, is yeah, always, always in effect always when we kibitz and so let's be straight I think it's a fascinating place we've reached and I remember when Tony Dungy won the Super Bowl that you know the first uh, and then Doug yeah. Williams the yeah. first black man to win a Super Bowl and it was really the the thing was I want to get our society to a place where that doesn't come up anymore well it still comes up and I think it's worth uh, noting Lamar Jackson, Russell Wilson, and Deshaun Watson, three black QBs, your three top MVP candidates, and who's probably third or fourth in that? A white running back, Christian yeah. McCaffrey. It's crazy, right? It's interesting, yeah, the inversion it of that. I, I love it because I, I think, again, like it shows that it doesn't matter what color you are and as long as you have game. I think Christian McCaffrey's done a phenomenal job. But going back to those quarterbacks, mm-hmm. so you, you talk about the AFC. You, you, you Obviously, Pittsburgh, Baltimore coming out of the north. You have uh, possibly the Houston Tech. All four of the, the South teams, I think, have a, still have a shot if the Colts. That's a bad loss track. for the – I mean, obviously, it's you don't want to lose loss, to the Dolphins. That's that, that's going to haunt them probably. It, it probably is going to come back and bite them in the butt. But then you, you go to the West. You still have the Chiefs and the Raiders and possibly the Chargers, right? I got news for you. The Chargers are the X factor in the AFC West because now it sets up, especially if the Chargers do not be surprised as the Chiefs – uh, head out to Carson, California. Don't be stunned if the Chargers win that game or be. going back out to Arrowhead. One way or the other, they have a chance to win that game. And as it sets up now, as I said to David and to Darren Carr right. in advance of that game, your your brother doesn't even need to go into Arrowhead and beat the Chiefs for you guys to win the division. Look at how their schedule sets up. If they continue to play at the level they've played at, which is no certainty, but if they do, the Raiders should get one of those two wild oh, no. cards. Yeah, or they, or or they, they might win, win the, the division. division they right? absolutely so, can win the division. Laugh have, all you want. So you have that, and then you, you go to the AFC East, and you have Buffalo in New England. Mm-hmm. And, and so you're like – there's so many teams that are like six and three, five and four. Like it's literally all right here. So anything can pan out, and that's what you love about football. The NFC is a completely different story, though. Yeah, it's it, it definitely <laughs> the NFC is now shaping up to be top heavy, and so yes. many directions we can go. But you mentioned the MVP candidates, and uh, it feels to me emerging out of out of uh, week ten here. The two storylines are well. I mean, there are there are a ton, as a matter of fact. Um, one. I don't think the NFC defending champs are going to the playoffs. I told you that yeah. before the season. No, I, I mean, it's, it, it is. It, when I, listen, I said this on the air. You With this loss in Pittsburgh, because you have to keep up. You, you have, you're trying mm-hmm. to keep up with the Vikings and the Packers. You're trying to keep right. up with, uh, obviously, the teams in your division, the Seahawks and the Niners. Then you have Philly. You have Dallas. New Orleans. New Orleans. I mean, you, there, there's a bunch of. At this point, you want the wild card candidates, not the division yeah. front runners, to be. Like, you want the Packers beating the Panthers. If yes. you're the Rams, if you're the Seahawks, if you're, these are the teams, you want the teams that have a hold on their division to vanquish the yes. teams that are uh, vying for one of those two, well, and the, the five and the, or well, six. And seeds. the problem is, you, you, we, <laughs> we were rooting for the Cowboys on the playing back, right? And then you know, I go to sleep, I wake up, and I see the, the Vikings won. So. You're fighting. Mm-hmm. You're you're you are in a dog fight right now to try to make it, and, and it's going to be an uphill battle. Now, hopefully, the, you know they can fix some things and get things going. But with all those injuries, you know they had seven linemen uh, suited up for the game, and all seven played. 
Like, like they that are, was crazy, and it was a mismatch before kickoff, but then once you start getting injuries in-game in Heinz Field, the mismatch was so severe. But that should not diminish the ongoing dominance. In a game that featured Aaron Donald, and I don't know if you heard uh, the 294 times that they brought it up within the 60 minutes, but uh, Aaron Donald's from Pittsburgh. That, yeah. that they they brought that up uh, well, a few it, times because you know you, you rarely that, that that will never that will happen uh, eight years again. Uh, it may happen in another eight years or right or another four years. I want to say right the when I think it's four, yeah every four every year. four years. So that, I mean that this rarely happens where he plays Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh. It was the first time Pittsburgh always went to St. Mm-hmm. Louis to play him. So it, it was a beautiful moment. I think and, and, and like I said when I was walking around town, like the people love him there. Because not only, like, he spends majority of his time there. He has a house there. He trains there. He does everything there next to your, obviously, next to the Steelers facility. So, Well, he grew up He grew up 10 minutes from me in Penn right. Hills. I am um, pro tip for anybody looking to get Aaron Donald's attention going forward. If you shout hail to Pitt, even if there are 200 other people around, he immediately locks eyes with you and, and is like, yeah, what's up? Yeah, he he he, he so hears it. It's funny. After the game, uh, you know, everyone's out and they're kind of, you know, it's a bunch of people. I think they have uh, Eric Scott is from went to Penn State. So there's a couple of Penn Staters on the team, and there's a lot of people. And Aaron was coming out, and someone said that, and he turned, and he kind of just looked, and then you know went on about his day. But it, it and and a sea of people, you know, and and, that, and that's the beautiful thing about it. he loves the city, and he actually played really well. Like there was he there was were time, there were times in that game where they had. Pouncey, Villanueva, and then whoever the left guard was. DeCastro was also uh, – yeah, yeah, they, well, they, they were like, had Matt Filer yeah, over there. they were like him, triple teaming him at, at some points while other guys are doing other things. And so, it, I mean, it just shows the respect that he had. And then, and then I, I mean, I have to say this because I don't know what your offensive coordinator was thinking to do a, a play-action pass on the five-yard line. I all You know why that vexes me so, Maurice? Because I beg – for the Steelers to run some play action. Now, I know Mason Rudolph is already a little sluggish with making a decision and and getting rid of the ball, so maybe him turning his back to the defense would probably only delay that. But still, finally you're going to run some play action when you're standing (laughs) in the end zone. Second safety in two weeks in Heinz Field. Yeah, that's not good. That was terrible. But Cam Hayward, dominant, and that pass rush in general – dominant and Mika Fitzpatrick and Joe Hayden and the rest of it it really is something to watch but let's not talk about that as much as Jared Goff and what do you think the wisdom I said again I I know I'm self-validating a lot but I happen to have been right a lot so far in 2019 when they when they made when they announced that deal I said what's the rush why did you have to get this deal done now why don't you let this season play out a little bit and see how he went to the Super Bowl all right, so but so that, what? So why do you have to pay him in September? That was you, you, it. Doesn't look wise now, does it? You just don't know. Like when you, you got to remember. Like you have to when you have when your team goes to the Super Bowl, regardless of how they played in the Super Bowl, they went to the Super Bowl. Sure. They people forget with the second half what he did in New Orleans in the NFC Championship game. Like he played lights out. So you have to reward your players for playing well. You, you remember it wasn't just him that got paid too. I mean. They paid Tyler Higby. They paid Sean McVay. They paid everyone. Everyone, and, and that's their mantra is if you do well, we will pay you. That's just how it is. I mean, there's a. I, I want to say they gave Robert Woods like a, money just because of how good he played. It had nothing to do with incentives. Like, here, you played well. Here you go. And so they. that's their mantra, and that's why guys want to go and play for them. And so sometimes it may backfire for a season or different things like that where you have other teams like the Redskins who are the total opposite. Right, and we're and and don't get me wrong, because I was just talking. Well, if you're if you're if you're conflating the NFC champs with uh, with the Redskins, no, I'm, then I'm we're just, really digging no, deep. I'm not. I'm just saying this the way the organization is ran. Right? I hear you. There's no, a that's reason a the Redskins point. have been bad for a long time because they mm-hmm. don't treat their players the right way, or the, or the people that they have in the organization. But I was just talking to someone like a, a Dolphins fan is like wearing their Dolphins gear, and it, it really just brought like clarity to everything. And they won two games, right? And they're like, "Yo, we're we're good." Like. And then as a Rams, we we only we've lost four. You know we're we're five and four, and, and like everyone's like, I was at the gym today. Someone's like, I can't believe you're wearing that. Like, woo woo, and I'm like, dude, like there's still it's in the- Monday morning. Yeah. You were in Pittsburgh last night. You flew back and went to the gym, and you're sitting here with me this morning. Yeah, I, I, listen, what a pro! I, I gotta go get it. Um, I'm I'm trying to go get this. You're thing. staying hungry, huh, Maurice? Yeah, I'm starving. 
That's what that's that's the way uh, Coach Jack Del Rio described you. You I, know, I'm always PO'd I'm, that you fell to the bottom of the second round, and then you yeah. have to stick it to the rest of the to league. everybody, even um, the ones in Jacksonville. Well, I I do want to talk about the state of running backs in the NFL. I I mean I'll I I will until proven otherwise. I don't think that the Rams should have made that level of deal with Jared Goff, and I feel like. I mean, you know, he's league average. You know, is is he? Yeah, I mean, is he? Can you rightly claim? And in fact, at this, this deep is, into this his career, problem. this is the problem. You can say he's league average, but he went to the Super Bowl. Not everyone's done that, right? So you can have these great guys like Carson Wentz. He didn't go to the Super Bowl. All right, well that's Let's circumstantial, be, but, not, but I hear you. But he, but he, he was he's been hurt every year, and they still paid him, right? You have guys like. I don't know. Um, the ta- well, the takeaway, Maurice, is is that you d- – I, I, this is something I've been saying pretty much spaghetti. Correct me if I'm wrong. Have I not oh, – in fact, I know I've been saying this since uh, summertime, that we have now achieved QB saturation. All the injuries, notwithstanding to quarterbacks, and you see all these guys, all the backups in there, there are plenty of human beings that can play decently – in the NFL at QB now. You don't have to overspend to retain your guy like that. I, I don't, I don't in his fourth year, it's well. all about Sean McVay. Everything's about they the, the cutaways to Sean McVay, it's not about as opposed to I don't know, well, you know, well, Drew Brees and Tom Brady are the high end examples of wise and old uh well, QBs like, who like are Aaron savvy. Rogers, right? I'm just starting I'm just thinking like what's what's any QB gonna do in the clutch? It's always a cutaway to Sean McVay. What's Sean McVay gonna tell no Jared question. Goff to do? And that's a weird dynamic to begin with. Yeah, I think again, I, I think you know, part of being a coach is you you know, it's your job to put him in position to be successful. It's and Sean McVay doing that because there's now some growing cynicism that maybe Sean McVay rested on his laurels a little bit and hasn't adjusted. Color me stunned pleasantly so as a Steelers fan that two weeks uh, to prepare for that Steelers defense and they didn't score an offensive touchdown. Well, Cooper think, Cup didn't catch a ball. I know well, well, he got owned by Mike Tomlin and Keith Butler. Well, they did a great job of, of double teaming them a million different ways and, and and changing the coverage and and really playing to their leverage. I, the Pittsburgh Steelers, they, they what they did, they played very sound foot. They didn't blitz much, right? You, you didn't see a lot of blitzing because the rush was getting home. Mm-hmm. But that allowed them to play different co- coverages and different leverage on Cooper Cup and other guys. I mean, I swear they had a coverage called Double Cup, and they just literally had different guys doubling him in and out, making sure that he didn't get away from it. And when he did, you got the one PI penalty. Uh, but that was really it. Like, it, it was, you know, they did a phenomenal job. When you talk about Coach McVay, and I, I think, you know, we always talk about how the league makes adjustments, mm-hmm. right? After so many, you know, this, this is what this – I think Warren Sapp said it – I don't even know. I don't even know if I'm giving. It him was credit definitely for it. Warren Sapp, and I tried to give him credit for it because he said that to me eight nine years ago like, now, and it, and fastest, it always ends up proving true. It's like what did he say? Like the fastest adjusting the, organism is the NFL, right? Is a defense? An is NFL the defensive defense. coordinator, right? And so with Coach McVay, is he understand? Like he's a very smart pl- coach. Is very smart player when he was playing, um, and he there's certain things that he knows his quarterback does well. And they try to do that as much as they possibly can, which is what great coaches do. But the other thing to that is you have to develop your quarterback to do the other things he doesn't do well better so that you can do those. Because if all you can do is throw in-breaking routes or this route or that route, or th- like teams are just going to start sitting on those knowing like this is what you're trying to do. So you have to find ways to throw out-breaking routes or go balls or posts. Or- well, they, they, they did a decent job at the start of the second half. You could see them moving the pocket a little bit to try and free up golf a little bit. But it ultimately still comes down to, especially – I'm going to talk about another contract, and uh, I told you that in December, Maurice, and I know you're a company man. I told you that a year ago now. I told you in January. What? Todd Gurley ain't right, and I uh, and now and now so we. So I'm going to disagree with he ain't right because okay, well then at, it's weird that they're not using well, him. That, if that's he is okay, that's then that's com- weird. That's something completely different. I, I think if you saw the runs that he had, I thought he looked Pittsburgh, great. He looked, he looked spry. He looked just like the guy that we saw I, last year. I agree with you, but then it's weird that they're not uh, that they're not concentrating and the, I think that's on him. The, more. the what is that? That's the $65 million or whatever. How many, that's the question. Like The $45 million question is, why aren't you using this? Why is he out of the game? And we brought this up. Why is he not in the game in the fourth quarter? And I, I, um, I had heard some rumblings that he had said something in his press conference. I, don't, I, don't, I didn't really listen to it because um, I normally do it today and then kind mm-hmm. of work on it later on tonight. But um, in any situation, the best players need to be on the field, period. 
Um, and that 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 you is give a, you I, I you I give mean, the I, ball to your best. Play. I, I remember playing the Cincinnati Bengals. I'm not, I can't lie to you. I remember playing the Cincinnati Bengals at home, and it was like fourth and two, and and Coach Del Rio was like, "We're going for it," and so uh, I remember the coach called a play right, and Jack was like. Hell no. We're not doing that. What are you – give the ball to Maurice. He's our best player. Give him to Maurice. He'll get it. Right? And that's how it should be. I kind of agree. I, I mean, I don't kind of agree with that. I Obviously, you can vary things. If you always give the ball to Maurice, then, every fifth time you can use him as a decoy. No but question. that's the point. And if you'll recall to use the, the Rams at Steelers game as an example of that, when the Steelers are third and a couple of inches, literally, on their side of the field, oh, they yeah, ended they up going the, for it the on the little, fourth down and the rolled Mason Rudolph, and, and that worked, in fact, uh, twice well, when they ran that. Well, it shouldn't have worked because the corner fell. If the corner doesn't fall, he sits on it, and then you probably have a sack in that situation. But that's I hear you. But, but the point is, but the preceding play on yeah. third and inches, I was pulling my hair out because th- at that moment, in, in that situation in the game, they put – Mason Rudolph, third in inches, in the gun and with an empty ball. backfield. No. Oh, no, no. Yeah, I know which one you're talking empty about. Empty yeah. backfield on third yeah. in inches. Just go under center and put your head down. You're six foot four, fella. Just get the first down. What are they doing? That. But the point being, why would you not have Todd Gurley when you are required, no matter what you think of him in 2019, you as a defense are required to focus on number 30. You must pay him some mind, and when you remove that, you make it easier on the defense. Same thing as going into the gun in short yardage. Well, they're obviously not going to run it here, so we know what they're going to do. Why would you show your hands so like the that? Thing, the thing to me was Todd broke off like a couple 12-yard mm-hmm. runs, and he had a 20-yard run, and like all of a sudden, like I'm like, oh, this is a Todd from Denver. Uh, last year where he started breaking off these long runs. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, oh, there, it's over. And then the start, the start of the fourth quarter, he's not even on the field for two drives. And he's not even looking like he's going to go in. And so we're, we're, I'm, we're, I'm still trying to figure out what that what the situation is as well. I mean, I think America wants to know, all the Ram Nation wants to know, is because if he, if he is, which we still know this offense, in order for this offense to go, you have to have a running game. It's a play action pass offense. You can't play action pass with no no run attack, right? Why wouldn't you put it there when he was gashing this defense that is going up the field? I don't care. I don't care if they don't give him the ball more than six, eight times, but he has to be back there for, as the decoy. But I, I I will say the larger question then becomes if you look at Todd Gurley and the amount of money being paid to him. One, two, David Johnson, an abject bust because of injury and otherwise since he signed his big deal. Levy and Bell, I mean Oh, hold on. Under two yards a carry. That, that's that has zero to do with him. The I, only person that's stopping him I, is Adam Gase. I listen. No, no, that, no. You no, watch no. those. Don't that has Le'Veon looks I, phenomenal. You, have you not watched it? Have you watched him? Yes or no? Why? Have yes. you? I've, I've, I've seen yes. Le, Le'Veon still looks like the Le'Veon that was at Pittsburgh. That's why Pittsburgh Maurice, tried to trade for him. Maurice, he played deadline. the New York Giants yesterday. Not exactly. Well, uh, he didn't really world play. Beat. He didn't really play in the Giants game. He was coming. I mean, he had a what he was banged he had, up. He had a knee and spaghetti. ankle. Right? He had he had at least thirteen carries and he had under two yards a carry, so that's not phenomenal. The larger point is, and then to a lesser degree, Freeman down in Atlanta is now banged up. Why and Zeke Elliott even, who is healthy, was lousy or was shut wasn't lousy, but was shut down by the Vikings on Sunday Night Football. The Vikings are good defense. That's fine, but the larger issue is who do you and pay then? Because he, 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 well, right? Who, why, but why would you ever pay a running back that kind of money? Well, this why would the, you ever so invest? Would in, you would you not pay Christian McCaffrey? I don't know. No, I don't think I would. I think that it would is becoming pay, clear. Would you not pay Dalvin Cook? No, I don't think. I, so, I, so I mean, it depends what you would pay. Let's them. remember. Let's remember this. Dalvin Cook saying, missed all of last you're, season. You're, you're living in the. You're living in this moment right here. They paid Todd last year, and Todd was rolling last year. And this this question wasn't. I mean, there's had certain, almost no impact on the postseason, though. That's because they well when they played the Cowboys, he had four, like okay, twelve carries for one hundred and forty yards, like in the touch. Like he had he had an impact. That was their choice to not use him in the Super Bowl. He had six carries in the Super Bowl. Like like I only can impact the game if you allow me to impact the game. All right, but I'm just telling you. And then well, but that, Saquon but, Barkley. The point is, it's not about the talent. It's not about. How they're being used? The, what? What? I mean, it, it, it is about. Wait, I'm sorry. It used. is about those things. What the the number one issue is is that in the 21st century, the banging, the re, the repeated abuse that those running backs are taking puts them on the shelf more than 
their predecessors. You didn't spend nearly as much time out of games with no. injury for whatever but reason. But I was utilized in different situations, though. I was, I was, I played receiver at certain, at certain points in my career. Like they would put me out. Like, and this is where I, this is where I get upset with a lot of these coaches that you, those players you name. David Johnson was a receiver in college. Why is he not out there as a mismatch? Well, you know what I saw? I saw Pittsburgh put Jalen Samuels out at wide receiver on the linebacker and run a speed out, and he dropped it. But you're utilizing his talent as a mismatch. Like, this dude was a receiver in college. Todd Gurley can play receiver. Put him out there. Like, you don't have to turn around and hand running backs the ball anymore. I know, but you're Christian getting lost McCaffrey. in the weeds no, with no, my point. No. Why, why, these guys are taking up so much of the cap. And but what I'm saying is – Either because of the coaches or because of injury – or because that's, that's of it. diminishing returns from the bang that they've taken over three or five seasons. But you can say that seasons. about every position, though. No, like, I've, I've had I've had, this, I've had this debate uh, with one of my my, my boys on, in our group chat. People are like, well, so who do you play? You pay quarterbacks? Well, okay, Drew Brees has got his thumb hit, and missed nine games, like, and he's a a twenty five percent of your cap, right? You talk about all these other guys that have gotten hurt. Big Ben just got you know, broke off. We, we don't have him. Can I tell you the answer to that question that Matt Money Smith told us at the start of the season? It's left tackle. The mistake that the Dolphins, they're winning games and they want to and whatever else. And I think it was you who actually made this point, or maybe it was Handsome Hank. You're, uh, you, I confuse you two. You're basically yeah, the, same the same human being yeah. to me. Um, is uh, Either way is – Tua, if the goal is to get Tua, maybe Laramie Tunsil isn't protecting his blind side because he's lefty, which right. is an interesting thought. But either way, that was a bridge too far. They shouldn't have given him away, and obviously they shouldn't have given away Minka either. And it's also funny that they've now essentially played themselves out of the, the first overall pick anyhow, they, one way or the they other. They'll probably get the LSU quarterback then. I guess they could. They might end up with him, but but uh, you're getting lost in the weeds, spaghetti, right? I'm just. I'm this just saying. Like, and by you, the way, I think I'm just saying. Who do you pay I, then? I, I also said the Giants shouldn't have taken Saquon a year ago, and that looks right too. No, but every they, situation they're, they're not using Saquon. That's you can't Saquon. His first game against the Cowboys had 11 carries in the first half for like 100 and some yards, and then they didn't give him the ball the rest of the game. What like so in, the play, in what mind? Go ahead. I, I'm just trying to figure out like if I if I see a talent. Right. If I if I know I have uh let's say if I have five players and let's say the tight ends number one, receivers number two, running backs three, whoever my number one player is, I am gonna get him the ball as many times as I possibly can. It's like the Cleveland Browns. You have Odell Beckham over there. How can you not get him the ball? Like you traded for him. You how can you not get him the ball? Period. Look, whatever you do, the number one objective should be getting the best player the ball as many times as possible. People are afraid of differentiating, but in 2019, the Baltimore Ravens ha stuck their neck out. They picked up where they left off in 2018. They didn't say, all right, this potentially gimmicky thing that played like a knuckleball in the second half of 2018 got us into the postseason, but are we really going to invest in Lamar Jackson? You said it's a great idea to stick with Lamar, but you must build around him. You called that one. That was right. I agreed with you. Know you know what they did, though. You want to know what they did? What? See, people don't understand what they did when they when this whole off season. I know what they did. What right? they do? I agree. What they do this off season? They built it up. They brought in Greg Roman. They invested deeper in it instead of getting back they and treating went, it as a side project. They made it the core of their philosophy. What they did this off season, which is what every coaching uh, staff should do when you have a player of that caliber, any type of player. They went back to Louisville and brought all their coaches back. Hmm. And they said, what did you, you do? You did tell us that a couple what of times. What did you yeah. do to get him to play this way? What kind of runs? What And what, what passing? What, what, what is were the concepts that he was great at? Because, what, what, again, you have to go to where – see, it's, football, it's, it's deeper than what people like. Yes, it's, it, I always tell people it's checkers, not chess, which is it's true. But when you have a, 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 a tremendous talent, like let's say Lamar Jackson, I'm going to go out there and be like, okay, what did you do to have him throw for 4,500 yards and have 1,500 yards rushing? What did you do? So then I can learn because I have to let my ego go out the window because the, the, we're, we're talking about Todd Gurley and the Rams. Remember what Todd did at the University of Georgia? What, what kind of offense did they run? You remember? No. They ran an old pro style, I, fullback. Oh, oh, oh I, I would have said I. Okay, yeah, I'm so, sorry. That Remember, is, so I, I did know that they, they don't have they don't have they don't have that here. They're running three, four wide receiver sets. Mm -hmm. Like that's not who he is. Todd is a downhill runner. He needs to go downhill, and he once he hits a hole, he'll hit it because he has the speed to go through it. He's two hundred twenty pounds, two hundred fifteen pounds. You have to 
if this is what again, if this is what you want to do, right? But granted, I feel like they're going more for Jared because that's you know they just paid him a hundred million dollars. He's the first overall pick, so they're trying to go to what he's comfortable with. What is he comfortable with? The spread system, where everything is out there. You kind of see what's going on, and so you have conflicting issues right now. And they have to find a way to have a happy medium in this situation, it's so that you can thought. utilize both of them. And all these well, the defense is, and it's, I mean, you know, going against Mason Rudolph and uh, a you know a diminished collection of pass catchers. That I, I'm not going to hang too much on the Rams' defensive performance, but the defense since Jalen Ramsey arrived, it does feel oh, no, they, they play- tuned up and ready oh. to roll. Um, but you know what? Now let's talk about. So we talk about Lamar Jackson, Eddie Spaghetti. Here's a fun exercise. I, I love the draft and what you should have done and what if and all that kind of stuff. Um, spaghetti, help us out here. Sure. Pick it up from Josh Rosen. T- pick it up from the eleven, from the tenth overall pick, and read through. And let's just very quickly assess if that team should have taken Lamar Jackson or the guy they took. Okay, so go ahead. The tenth pick, the the Cardinals took Josh Rosen. Obviously, no longer on the team. Should have they uh, obviously taken talk about him. what no. if if they would have if the Lamar. Cardinals do- they didn't take they should they, they weren't ready for him. Because you got to remember, like their offensive line was horrible. They weren't built for what, they, and they weren't willing to, um, and, and really Baltimore wasn't willing to do it either. They weren't willing to like do what it took to get Lamar Jackson. Right? It's to, a it's a fair point that given their conventional um, sort of approach, Lamar Jackson would have been a bust. We probably right. would have seen very little of him well, and, at and, this point. But Cliff Kingsbury wouldn't be there right, right. now. Right. So think, or about, he'd be coaching Lamar Jackson. Yeah, well, so think about what Cliff Kingsbury's done with Kyler Murray. They literally run the exact same offense mm-hmm. that they ran at Texas Tech and Oklahoma. You, when you have those type of players, you have to change everything. And that's why I thought. Josh would have been good there because he was a pro style quarterback. He could mm-hmm. do all those different things. Um, they just weren't, you know, at that point they they just didn't they weren't ready. But I don't think Lamar would have been successful in Arizona. I agree. Next. I mean, two two offensive coordinators in the wor- historically worst offensive line. Um, the Miami Dolphins eleventh took Minka Fitzpatrick, who is now a Steeler. Well, I mean that's a that's a tough one also to address given the moves they've made. They shouldn't have traded Minka clearly in hindsight. Well, they, um, that I, pick's I think, not going to have the value that they then, anticipated. Though? Who was their quarterback then? Last year was uh, Cuddy, right? No, it was, was that last year the Cuddy? No, yeah, that was last year. Cuddy no, was that he's been out for a while. Was no, it? that was just last year, wasn't it? it oh, he did. Am I that back. crazy that year? I can't remember? Was it him and Matt Moore last year, or, was it Tan- or no, not Matt Moore? Tannehill. It was Tannehill. It was Ryan Tannehill was there? Oh, it was Tannehill. So, uh, but Tannehill was out for the year. That's why they brought Jay Cutler in. Yeah, that feels oh, like right. that feels like seventeen years ago. That yeah. was just last I mean, year. But uh, now, yeah, obviously I, I they would have been better off. But, with, but they, they would have been better off with Lamar. But I, I don't think because of his Lamar being from down there, and I think Adam Gase is not a he wouldn't have been able to coach him if that makes sense. Like he doesn't his style. See what people don't understand. Like your style as a coach has to fit the player. Right, like that's right, John. I don't know. I was just watching the thing. Harbaugh was uh, John Harbaugh was talking to Lamar on the sideline. Like he has embodied the the Florida mentality in Baltimore. Like, look, you were you are the man. This is your team. You do. You don't. I don't care what you wear. You can come in pajamas. You come in shorts. It can be three degrees. I don't care. But this is your team. You and and they. He was embodied that. And so when you get a guy like Lamar Jackson or anyone else, oh, there's a no. It, Jay Culler was 2017. That's when oh. Tannehill got hurt with Matt Moore. It was Tannehill. We were right. Tannehill also did get hurt, and Brock Osweiler was quarterback for five games. Oh, that's year. right. Oh, so that makes sense. Man, I'm, I'm bad. having a hard time that's keeping bad. things straight season after yeah, season. But I, I still think Minka, like, first of all, <laughs> I'm not trading Minka Fitzpatrick, right? Like, you have to learn to use him, and, 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 and you obviously you see Mike Tomlin and those guys are putting him in position to be – Arguably up for def- he's probably going to be defensive player. Of the Everybody year. who declared, I mean, it's just that that I we don't need to revisit that because we've been over it and right on it since they made the deal. But Dude, were you were you happy for it? Or I, no? I, I without uh, without uh, batting an eye, I never for a second said that it was something. Maybe if there was, a, the, it never made sense that the Steelers would hold on to a first round draft pick and people act like first round draft picks oh. are guaranteed to be successful NFL players. It's no. a it's a coin flip. It's like a 60-40 well, deal. So and that's who knows what that's, they would have gotten. So this is the thing. Pick. So just like you said that 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 is the Rams mentality. They're like I'd rather get a proven commodity than have a crapshoot of a draft right, pick. Of course. Cuz you don't know if you'll hit him. Okay, well, sorry, continue Spaghetti. 12 the Bucks took Vita Vea. 
Okay, that's, that's a that, great that's pick. A great I love pick. that You're boy. That, that guy is a moose. Oh my god. Uh, Washington took Deron Payne, nose guard from Alabama. I mean, we'd certainly be singing a different song of, yeah. out of D.C. if they had him. But would Drake Gruden is he ready for that? Like, uh, he did a good. Don't forget with who. He, well, he Andy. Yeah, he only only had an Andy and Carson Palmer. Like, didn't he, he prefer Cap and Marv over Road that, or is that the other way around? Or Hugh? I'm trying to figure that out. I, I, I can't remember how that went down. Was I, I can't remember. I think it was Hugh. Hugh wanted yeah wanted Cap. Cap. Okay. Next. 14, the – This is the big one. The Saints took Davenport. Oh, I'm Mark sorry. Davenport. So, that's a good pick. No, that's They're a obviously good pick, not going to yeah. replace. So, 15 then, I think. The Oakland Raiders took Colton Oh, Miller. I'm waiting for Cincy to come up. Okay. Oh, you got you got something to go. Uh, 16, the Buffalo Bills took uh, – was it Tremaine Evans? That's a good pick. Good pick. He's solid. The Chargers, 17, took Derwin James. You know, best, you know that's probably that. the best pick in the draft. Mm-hmm. Uh, 18, uh, the Packers took Jair Alexander. Okay. Great pick. Uh, Great. Dallas took Leighton Van Der Esch at 19. Solid. Great. Twenty, the Lions took Frank Ragnow to play center, but I mean they have Stafford. I guess you don't really need him there. Okay, so far this is checking out. Twenty-one is uh, the Bengals who. That's took the Billy one Price. I remember sitting there. I don't remember if I was with you at that. Yeah, we draft. were. We were there. And I remember. I mean, I was like, "What the Bengals? What are you're just going to ride with Andy Dalton? You're never. Well, I, you're never going to the Super Bowl the, who, with where Andy." Where were the Jags in that situation? They picked twenty-ninth. Uh, they took Taven Bryan. Yeah, that's, that's that was that's the a one. huge one. That's that the, the other one. one I wanted to get to here. You also might make a case in hindsight that maybe Pittsburgh should have gone Lamar. I thought that that was not an insane thing because Coach T Tomlin liked Lamar Jackson. Oh, he they're loves from him. this. They're you know Michael Vick really liked him, yeah. and and Michael Vick's from the same neck of the woods as Tomlin. And I talked to Mike Vick at the draft, and he's I said, "What do you think about? Did you think there was a chance?" He said, "You know." Coach T and I kind of talked about that, and he likes Lamar. That knuckleball, if you could throw him out onto the field with seven, and now in hindsight you wonder what that team would look like if you had dropped Lamar Jackson in versus Mason Rudolph. But but I think Cincy is the big one. It's sh- you know, guts, a big one. having some courage, at, at the, at, and, and then leaning into it has made the difference, and that's the Ravens. Credit to Harbaugh, but also he was about to get fired a year ago. And he, he puts Lamar Jackson, and he just went all in on that. And now he is in line to be the head coach of the year and have the MVP on his team for showing those kind of guts. There's, there's, there's a couple great. in a row here, I think, that actually they could have worked too. I mean, the Titans took Rashawn Evans, who's a good player. But, I mean, at this point. But that's not their – that's not their – he's not their – got to understand, like, Vrabel, that's not his style. Sure. They, like, it's – Lamar Jackson is – in order for him to be Lamar Jackson, you have to let him be Lamar. If well, you have sense. to bring it, Greg Roman or yeah, something you like have that. To, you have to really change everything. And Baltimore was really one of the only teams to probably do that. The the Pats at 23 took Isaiah Wynn, which is also, I think, kind of interesting. Uh, Carolina took uh, Moore, 24. Uh, Baltimore had their first pick, and they hey, took Hayden Hurst. I have to go to a fantasy meeting. You bum. I want to finish up with you real fast. Go one ahead. thing. Well, we talked about the Chiefs. The Chiefs are in real trouble. Yeah. Last thing, since uh, you are our Jags whisperer, is that the right move to go Nick Foles? I think it is. Uh, if, I think if I think if Gardner Minshew played much better uh, in that Houston Texans game, then you probably just kept Gardner in. But because Gardner Minshew uh, kind of stunk it up, and I think people have enough tape on him now to kind of see where his flaws are. It's hard. To, you just got to go back to your guy now and, and understand that. That's the bottom line. Consistent. We all get. We, we all like the shiny new object, but I think Gardner Minshew, and I think also Kyle Allen, who's been fine. This is nonsense. This right. this thing about the Panthers are going to let Cam Newton walk if you ain't bringing in somebody else. And by the way, they still have Greer, and I still think he t- gets some snaps. But the, here's the concern for the Jags: if Nick Foles plays pretty well. Then they can't let him go, and I'm. I see. You're I'm, I'm assuming go, no. Though. I'm assuming no playoffs for the Jags this what, year. What, what they're going to do is they're going to keep Foles and keep Gardner, and then eventually, once Foles is done, Gardner will be the quarterback. Huh. I don't That's know if I love that. I don't know how inspired that is. Maurice, what a pleasure to see you once yes, again. I wish we I'll could keep it further. Hey, real fast, it's time for the food block presented by Bon and Viv Spike Seltzer. Before you run, Maurice, what did you eat on the banks of the Three Rivers? Did you get a Primanthes? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't do all that. I, I, went I don't fancy know why you pansy. don't do that. Eh, everybody goes to those places. I wanted to go to the fancy pantsy place. So I went to Eddie Merlot's, uh-huh. uh, had a nice Wagyu steak. Oh, I only nice. ate like a, a couple bites. It was it was too rich for my stomach. Wow! <laughs> and then I had I had uh, Rockefeller <laughs> oysters, which was nice. Ooh, yeah. that's very good. I yeah. like that. You and are. Then, yeah, I went fancy. Were you not? with JB Long? 
Uh, no, I was I was with some friends out there, so it was pretty cool. Did you go to Pamela's? My old man. We went to the by. we went to the pancake house. It wasn't Pamela's. We were going to go to Pamela's. We My were old go to man and, and Mo Damashek would have loved to have met up with you. I don't know when oh, they're going to awesome. get a chance. They yeah, would love to I, have bought you breakfast. If Pittsburgh makes the playoffs, you never know. We may have to go to Pittsburgh. Wait, who's we now? Me and you. Oh, if oh, if just the Steelers. Yeah. I thought you meant if the Jags go, then you'll no, no, pay no, 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 no. We like we would go because I'm a resident Steeler. I mean, it's still my second home. <laughs> That's true. You did you matter. did announce your ownership of it. Yeah, Maybe it you could unlock all the secret doors since I, you have the key to the city. They kind of let me walk through the city and what I do what I want. So I warned. We'll I warned. I, I was on radio all all uh, last week, and I just kept warning everybody: if you see Maurice and his if there's two little boys the with ground, him, you know run away because you're going to get pelted with snow. Maurice right. is a disrespectful visitor. No question. Now owner well, of our I, city. It's not. A, I wasn't. I mean, at that point, we'd owned the place by then. I mean, we bought it in 2000. Well, the good news is, look forward to hearing Dave Damashek alongside J.B. Long come 2020 when I get in the broadcast booth. Thanks, Maurice. Great to see you, Pally. All right, I'll see you guys later. There goes Maurice Jones, Drew. Did we cover everything, uh, Spaghetti, or do we have uh, a little bit more to kibitz about I mean, we covered. We covered uh, – What would you eat this weekend? I uh, Well, Saturday I had a bit of a, like a party for the uh, college games. We had people come over for the Penn State-Minnesota game, which was at 9 o'clock a.m. My phone didn't ring. That's Pacific. funny. I didn't get any text messages or anything. Party. Uh, what party? I uh, it was just like a it was what college football watching party. You were yeah. You I were like I like to watch football. I like to. I, that's something I enjoy. And parties I like. I would have loved. And if I you like there. food. I just know you're you're a busy man on the weekends. Oh, is that what you knew? Actually, can I tell you something? Sure. In this case, you were correct because I was off shooting something. The cat's out of the bag. If you are a fan, and I know a lot of people within the sound of my voice are fans. Um, of the NFL when I asked what if butterfly effect type questions about what if the tuck rule had gone the other way and so on. Um, and we do those animations and have for eight, ten years now. Well, we've done a live action one. And as I tweeted over the weekend, listen, if they can turn trolls and Angry Birds and Playmobil into feature length movies, then I think the NFL is well within its rights to also get a more extended totally. uh, execution of it. And so me, Daniel Jeremiah, Steve Weiss, Cindy Freeland, Cole Wright, Jim Trotter. Um, oh, and of course, Brian Baldinger so um, was a great group. And we sat around and we kibitzed about it. And it's uh, going to be a fun thing that uh, you'll have by year's end, I think. I think they're going to start dropping those out there as they edit them up and everything before the end of regular season. So be on the lookout for those. What do you serve awesome. at the party, though, as we do our food block? Uh, yeah, I mean, I know that Handsome Hank made fun of me on Twitter for uh, the, the picture I posted, but I had it was a lot of, like, vegetables. A lot was of, Handsome like, Hank invited? Stuff. He was not, no. no. I didn't think that people want to wake up. Like, people showed up to my doorstep at 9 o'clock in the morning, which is crazy to think, but there was a Penn State fan. But it's just an early time for Pacific, so instead of going out to a place to watch these games and then the uh, LSU Alabama, Alabama game was on at uh, 1230, so it was just too early to go anywhere, so we had people come over, and we just did, like, it was more of healthier stuff, a lot of whole wheat healthier options. Stuff. Yeah, it was, we gotta, you gotta, you know, I gotta watch my uh, my figure during well, the, you're, the winter. Well, you are a fat, I and know. you know how I know I'm a fat is because I've lost 10 pounds, and I'm still a fat. That That's when it's really grim. It's like, hey, shape it up. And I am, I, and I'm about a third of the way to what I need to lose. It's yeah. During the problem with Los Angeles, it's not like it's back. Where if we were back east and it's cold out, you wear your jacket and stuff. During like you know four or five six months, you you can cover up. Out yeah. here, it's it was like 84 degrees on Saturday, so you always look overweight no matter what time of year it is. So. What was great, I will say, is um, that uh, and and it does. Having a, I mean, I don't as much anymore. I try to be a professional and make sure I'm focused in on all the games on Sunday. So I don't do it as much anymore. But at the height of watching football on Sundays over at Kimmel's Place with mm -hmm. all the fellas, um, it is interesting the adjustment you need to make as an East Coaster when you land on the West Coast that if you're watching Sunday football or college football on, on Saturday that it's more of a brunch experience. You don't just jump totally. right in on the fries and tacos and everything else. you got to start it off with some donuts and some pastries and such. Not any healthier ultimately, but you still want to you want to taste the breakfast. Um, but it's also – um, it was it, it was interesting to me that every game now it's weird the the um, programming gods have kind of taken up residency in my brain because 
I, my reaction to seeing LSU Alabama, I looked up to set the right. the DVR for it, and I thought, well, five o'clock is it on CBS or what? What channel is it on? And as I was saying, I was like, twelve thirty. This is an outrage. Uh, the games are at night, and then I thought, no, no, no. That's the way it's supposed to be. I like them under the light. Well, also because the SEC I know has the uh, the contract thing where they only have one primetime game a year with the CBS contract. I think it's supposed to come uh, be up soon. And the one primetime game they had already was the Georgia Notre Dame game. So that's why LSU Bama had to be a daytime game. Oh, is that what, yeah. what the reason you was? You only get one. Well, listen, for whatever reason, I liked it. And by the way, as I say, I was shooting something uh, on Saturday, so I missed that game and had to watch it back on DVR. But you just can't beat that autumn light, you know? It's uh, it's it's uh, uh, the lights and everything else make it feel grand and special and everything else. But to me, given a choice, I like it under the light of day. I don't like NFL playoff games all being played at night. I, I like them better when you see when you when you feel the elements a little bit and those break through a lot better. I mean the Packers Panthers game was a great indication of that. Besides that, yeah, like with the with the snow and it got darker at the end of the game, which is awesome. I do agree with you that the daytime games are better, uh, especially when you could tell it's super cold outside just from what you can look at the screen. The one funny thing I was going to bring up and this is perfect to talk to you about because of of your Indiana ties Big 10 Every Big Ten game that I've watched is just gray. It's just constantly gray. It's a it's a it's a ten o'clock. Well, I was o'clock. called a steel gray sky. It's that eleven was o'clock. It was described. It's like a noon kick, whatever time it is a day, and it just it's still always an overcast. It's mm-hmm. dark. The lights are on. It's noon. It's like I've never every game in the Big Ten conference. It's insane. How it's every, heaven. <laughs> it used to be when I was growing up. Almost every game outside of Ross Aid in Purdue. Um, I think every single stadium had artificial turf, which t- which took away from the games. Okay. But now they're almost all, I think, either natural grass or sure. the or the hybrid. So that makes it look a little bit um, more pleasing to the eye. Um, what do you think, though? Give me your final four now. I'm already getting angry because I know Alabama's going to go. But it, you know, if college football, the thing that why college football is better than all the other sports in terms of postseason tournaments is that the entire season by sort of intrinsically was built that it's a weekly episodic playoff series. And once you lose a game at any point in the season, you lose full control of your path to the Final Four if you're one of the big five, if you're a Power Five conference team. And the thing that continues to disrupt that or what should be justice I, listen, I don't know what to tell you. There are any number of examples where the Saints, the best team in the NFL last year, let's say they were. Well, they lost. That was a weird call that they, they lost on. Yeah, but it still counts, right. and and that's they don't get a second crack at it. Alabama, the argument, yeah, but you know that they're better than blank. You know they're better than Minnesota. You know they're better. All right, they didn't even win their division. That's the way the cookie crumbles. I'm sorry, Houston Oilers. Go bellyache to them in the late eight, in the late seventies. They were the second best team in the NFL when they lost to the Steelers, though in the playoffs. Nobody said, "Yeah, but they still should get to go to the Super Bowl." We all know that the Seahawks and Niners. We see the renewal of that rivalry yeah. when one beats the other in the playoffs in uh, before on the way to Super Bowl forty eight for the Seahawks. That was as close a game as you could get. Everybody knew that the Seahawks and Niners were the best teams. Nobody raised their hand and said, yeah, just send the Niners anyway. Everybody knows they're better. When the Broncos lost in overtime to the Ravens in 2013, nobody said, yeah, everybody knows Peyton's Broncos are the better team and would win nine out of ten times. Put them in the Super Bowl instead. That's just not the way it works. Alabama, you lost in your division. You're not even going to be playing for the conference championship. You then don't get to jump over that and be in the Final Four. How say you? I I agree in the sense that if you lost, you should be out. But they do have the Iron Bowl left. They, Auburn's a good team. If they beat Auburn, they'll they'll still be in the mix. I mean, LSU, if they slip up and they're, just, they're both one-loss teams in the SEC, I, I think you could say far and away LSU is the best team right now. I, I'm okay with saying that. I think Clemson will, will still be the will, If Georgia be beats them, if one loss Georgia vanquishes undefeated LSU, I'll hear an argument for LSU. What I will not stand for is an Alabama argument. But I think, but then who, the four. So let's say LSU. Let's say they go undefeated. LSU. Let's say Clemson stays undefeated. You lost at home, Alabama. Then, you have no claim to anything. And at then this o- point. Ohio State. Who who would you? Who is your fourth team then? Is it a one-loss Georgia? Is it? Are we assuming you, that Minnesota is going to lose head to head? 
to I missed it, it as a couple of tough games left. Okay, but let's let's just say it's not going to happen. Everybody is way to say I hate to be a, a curmudgeon about it, but let's say that but that the Gophers get to an undefeated spot against okay. Ohio State and Ohio State's undefeated. If that game's relatively close, what case would you make for Alabama over Minnesota? Al- I don't care. And and the argu- And let me just take away the one I'm predicting most people, including you, are going to make. You know deep down, Dave, that Alabama would beat Minnesota head to head on a neutral side by I, multiple touchdowns. Yeah. All right. I again, I don't. I I'm not in control of when the NFC West has more good teams in it than the entire AFC in certain years. I can't. Well, all right. Well, so what? So that 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 I that's unfortunate. But you got caught up in an era when there were other heavyweights in your specific immediate um, division, and that makes it so that you don't get to play in the in the national championship now if you if we can meet halfway and i would agree on this if you want to give me instead of a one loss alabama you want to give me a one loss oklahoma or maybe an oregon or utah instead of uh of putting alabama in there like always i'm okay with that that's right if if uh, the pac-12 i mean it does it matter that it's a Power Five conference or does it not? Is the ACC weak this year? Yes. yes, of course it is. Now I'm getting into self-interviewing, and that never works out for me or for anyone else, really. But yes, the ACC in 2019 is weaker. But it's also a Power Five conference. That matters or it doesn't. And you can't – and and based on the, the history since they started doing this thing and BC even go back to the two-team – BCS championship game, it's supposed to be relevant that you're in a Power 5 conference, and yet the SEC, it always skews in their direction, and I'm here to tell you that's rubbish just as it's unfair that in the NBA in the 80s, the Lakers had a relative breeze to get to the finals to play the Celtics, who had to play through, had to get through the Pistons and Dominique and the Bucks and the Sixers. It was always unfair because Larry Bird and company were going to be a little more fatigued and beaten up than Magic and company were. But that's the way the cookie crumbles. Sure. It's not, I'm, I, I'm sorry, there only is one team that gets to come out of it from that side. You cannot have, th- you can't have two of your Power Five conferences not represented because well, Alabama we know deep down is really good. Well, it's funny is like Clemson Crazy. there's a there's a really simple path for Clemson to be probably the only undefeated team in the final four I mean it can get messy if like you said LSU loses to Georgia if Penn State takes down Ohio State and what's like two weeks or something like that they won't, especially if okay. Chase Young is not playing I I agree they probably won't they're not as good but if that happens it's like a one loss Ohio State a one loss LSU one loss Alabama undefeated Clemson you have a bunch of you have two one loss uh, Pac-12 I would love teams. it if they tried to keep Ohio State out oh. in favor of Alabama if 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 Ohio State I mean that I don't think it would if the Gophers got to a title game and lost to one loss Ohio State Ohio State would go but I I mean again I would not argue for the Gophers much versus uh, Alabama, but again, I do think it matters the hierarchy of it. If you happen to get caught up in a good division, a couple of years ago, the NL Central in MLB, the three best records in baseball were all in that division. Mm-hmm. The third place team didn't get to go to the playoffs. All right, that's a shame. That stinks that you got caught in a bad in a in a bad season for you. The sports gods frowned on you. Uh, somehow Alabama is allowed to just defy that year after year. They lost a home game. They lost they lost at home. Yeah. I mean, but I- And it was a, it's a little overstated even how close that game was. Yes, it was great, but they had to ra- they had to put on a furious rally to even make it look close. It's not like it was Back and forth game to begin with. I LSU handled them pretty good to a degree. I think certain other teams get to a degree. I get it. They yeah. They Two get, is not going to get a degree. If Ohio He's State leave if, early. if Ohio State has one loss and Minnesota has one loss, Ohio State is still across the nation. Like because of their pedigree, people will favor them over Minnesota. I think it's one of those things. Same things with Alabama. It's it's they're always going to get the nod over other one loss teams. That being said, I think in terms of one loss teams, because Oregon only lost to Auburn on a neutral site, not even in their conference, that is probably to me the strongest one loss team just because they did not lose a Pac twelve game as of yet. So I, I think that I mean they should be involved in it as well. And if they you know, if if this is where we're tracking, then the thing I always look back on from whatever that was now, eight years ago, ten years ago, probably about eight, if Texas would have joined the Pac twelve at that point, 
then everything would have been clarified. You would have had four power conferences, and then just whoever wins that is are your final four representatives. But as it stands now, that fifth one throws it out of whack, and now we're evaluating. These guys are evaluating in a room like, well, the ACC isn't as good as the SEC, so the second-place team, but really it's the third-place team because that team didn't even win its division. Somehow trying to justify that ruins the whole thing, and it ruins the spirit of what has been true my entire life, which is – College football is better by structure than every other sport because you lose one game, you now lose control of your destiny. Right. Then you have to have things break the right way and people have to perceive you in a certain way. You run the table, you're always uh, in the mix for the national championship. Somehow that now is out the window in favor of some other stuff. It's weird to me. Um, last thing, and then we'll wrap it up here. You mentioned Penn State. That reminds you, me of your boy 26 and the back and forth of how Saquon's played, I think you – well, I'm curious now. Let's get an update. The biggest bust of the season, Falcons and Browns notwithstanding, um, is what I thought was going to be fascinating, 26 v. 26 in New York City yeah. this year, and neither one has worked out. Do you, are you willing to now admit that taking him was not the the – greatest uh, idea ever. I'm not going to get on his case for being injured. I mean, he has... Uh, they, That's they, what it is to be a running back, like we said with Maurice. But it's... Yeah, but... Do you it, have to factor that in. These guys are going to get hurt. Right, but Le'Veon Bell, for the most part, wasn't that injured this year, and he's just kind of... You know, the Jets are a bad team. He's been hurt a couple of times already this year. Yeah, but, but he... But Saquon should have been out. He should still be out. He should be out for a couple more games, according to how severe the injury is. I kind of agree with that. People go across the NFL, they say a high ankle sprain is like one of the most devastating, obviously besides like a, you know, a ruptured Achilles or a torn scale, what have you, because it's just a, an injury that lingers forever and you can't cut, especially if you're running back. Like the beat writers of the Giants are saying that he is not explosive because he is just not like looking to go lateral anymore. He, can, he cannot press off his, uh, off his foot. So I think he's injured and I think that it's just a lost season and I'm okay with them kind of tanking it. Do you think they're going to shut it down I, I with mean, 26? They, sh- they should at this point. I need him on my fantasy team. You told me last week I should dump him, and I wish I would have listened to you. Yeah, I, 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 he wasn't right. And he 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 came back. He rushed himself back because he thought there was a spark and a chance he, and he was in his head. And I don't blame him thinking, okay, well, Evan Ingram's going to be back. And Sterling Shepard hopefully at that point thought he's going to be back and healthy. If I'm back, Daniel Jones is playing really well. Like, you know, let's just see. How, like the defense at that point, Betcher kind of figured out certain things. And then literally since then, and the defense has been back to being awful. Both Solder and Remmers playing left and right tackle cannot block anyone. I mean, Daniel Jones yesterday, I'm not sure if you saw the play, Jamal Adams just came in and just took the ball from his chest. Like, I know a lot of the fumbles people have been getting on Daniel Jones's case, but when you don't have somebody blocking one of your sides and he had no idea Jamal Adams was coming, who was in one of the top three safeties in the whole league, he just took the ball from his chest. Like, what? I don't know what he's supposed to do in that case. It's just like the team was crumbling in every which uh, fashion. You people- know what's a fun question, though? If we assume Gase is all but certainly gone. I Well, yeah. But it's weird that they lose to the Dolphins and then bounce back to, to vanquish the Giants. And now this mix of teams that is vying for the first overall or for the first few picks – I wonder, I you know, I still say, I talked to Daniel Jeremiah this weekend, and I said, we're in that window now where every, uh, all the most of the experts are now saying, like, I don't know if any of these QBs is worth the f- first overall, and I don't know how many guys are really worthy of a first overall, uh, I mean, a first round grade, spoiler alert, four yeah. to five are going to go. So rest assured on that. But I wonder if you're a head coach, and let's say Shermer goes as well, which team Hey, both New York teams want to hire you. Which gig do you take? Do you go with Sam Darnold, Lev Bell, Quinn and Williams, and Jamal Adams? Or do you go to the Giants to take over with uh, Danny Dimes, Saquon, Evan Ingram, Dexter Lawrence, et al.? It's an interesting debate. That's a happen. tough. That's a really tough. Put a tough pin question. in that one. Let's uh, let's re- let's ask that to our pals for our Wednesday podcast. Matt Money Smith. Sure. And ha- oh, Handsome Hank's out. So that let's yes. let's put a pin in that. That's one. very good. Yeah. Cliffhanger. So you'll sit in for Handsome on Wednesday's video show. We appreciate uh, you following along and watching that. Uh, rating and commenting the podcast and watching on YouTube every week. We appreciate you, DDFP listeners, sending us the ears, the eyeballs every week. Um, Let's wrap it up there, shall we, Spaghetti? Sounds good to me. All right, we'll do that. Thanks to Maurice Jones-Drew. We hope he's not a stranger. He's a man about town, though. He's all over the football America. It's hard to to wrangle him. him. The other thing we got to get is David Carr. 
That was yes. the other guy yes. with his Raiders in play. We got to see if we can track him down. Yeah, I know people have been tweeting, and and we're trying to get David. Like there were some weeks that David could come on, and like you, we, we like schedule as you were busy. Other weeks that uh, like he was not available, but he wants to come on. We will get him on very soon. All right, excellent. Um, all right, uh, so for Maurice Jones, Drew and Eddie Spaghetti, back in a couple of days. Until then, thanks so much, football fans. It's been a thin slice of heaven. <laughs>